Hello, hello everyone. Hi, how are you? It's so good to see you all. And um, I'm super happy to have another event of Maths Aspirants Groups today. And I can see uh, many of you have turned your video on. It's so, so nice to see you all because it's like uh, talking to you directly, having all the good smiles on your face. So pleasant and um, I'm so happy. So, um, our our program so different kinds of programs are being held in you know uh, online platforms all these days as you know maths aspirants was started in 2017 and our founder uh, dr um vinod sir is here and uh, we are we all are really really trying to make this family big and uh, have so many so many programs so but i think um this program today that we are having is like more special because the audience here are um, very exclusive. They, they really chose to attend this program. It's not like any other program. So they have some vision, some goals, some dreams uh, to pursue. And that's why they are here. So um, a great um, applause to everyone who are here and um, let me talk a little bit about maths aspirants. Like, like you all know, and some of you don't know, maths aspirant groups are conducting so many programs related to mathematics um, through online, especially. And we have conducted so many webinars, national webinars, which even have, uh, uh, which even have international participation. And uh, we have our Renaud Kumar sir, and for the technical part, we have Vijimon sir, and guides like, uh, our favorite Ambar Vijay Kumar sir, Emeritus Professor Kusat, and also so many teachers and so many students who are really, really trying their best to make this uh, family grow. So with that very little introduction uh, about the program today, I have uh, Shiga here and I am one of the moderators of today's program and I'm so happy. My name is Ezina and uh, the program today is a chit chat. Uh, with the research scholars from international institutions. So when I talk about this, I'm, I'm feeling so proud that so many people uh, from our country are now uh, studying in so many countries, different countries, and they are getting placed. And uh, also the main part, the, the super part is they are trying to make other people's life better. Like you, we have the panel here, they are coming here and they are, um, sharing their knowledge to people from our place to make their lives better. That's the best part, I think. And for this panel, we have people from um, Austria, Denmark, US, UK, Finland, and Germany. So happy. So I firstly welcome our um, stars of the event, all the panel members, and I will introduce each of them after this. But now, for now, I'm gonna I'm gonna welcome all of them in one word. Welcome everyone, everybody, all the eight members of the panel members to today's event. We are so grateful that we you are here and so happy to. And also, um, our Vinod Kumar sir is here. Vijay Kumar sir is here. Special welcome to both of them, and uh, my dear Shika, who is my co-moderator she is here welcome shika and um, last but not the least all the participants so firstly i want to say you have made a great choice um, today in this evening a friday evening to attend this program so this uh this marks that you have taken a step uh, towards your goal so whatever goal you having uh, and I think uh, the program will benefit not only the mathematics aspirants, but also for uh, other uh, discipline 
uh, students because uh, the people here, uh, the panel here are sharing a knowledge of um, uh, different things, uh, especially how to how to get into a course abroad and so many things which will be helpful for every discipline. But I am super, super happy to welcome all of you, all the participants uh, for coming here and attending the program, make the best out of it. And especially because we are having two segments. So the first segment we will have uh, our panel members and they will speak to you for like five to six minutes about the basic things, the application and uh, uh, the course details, part-time jobs, all the fundamental things they will cover in a very short speech. So listen to this very carefully because the next segment, the second segment, you can interact with the panel members. So when you have a question or you have a doubt or anything, you post it to the moderator or specifically to anyone from the panel. And uh, here I want to note that if there is a question, um, it's like anybody can answer if they have some information about it. So this is how it works today. I hope it's clear for all of you, but we are here for any clarification at any moment. Let's have a smooth and wonderful um, discussion and chit chat. Okay, like we like we have in the poster. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna welcome our dear you know Kumar sir. Uh, to share a few words for all of us, to all of us. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Achuna. Good evening, everyone. It's a long time demand from Math Aspirant members to arrange a session, an interactive session with Rasa scholars from abroad. And uh, now I'm very happy that we have a rich panel of uh, members who are doing PhD in premier institutions across the world. And I am really proud to say that almost all the resource persons for today's discussion are from Math Aspirants group. Many of them are uh, with us, even from their BSc or degree days itself. I'm sure that today's session will certainly be beneficial to all of them, all of the people who are uh, really want to do PhD or masters abroad. I welcome everyone to this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vinod sir. That was amazing. And now I'd like to welcome Ambad Vijay Kumar sir. Um, yeah, to to uh, ha get some to get some uh, blessings. We are so so <coughs> eagerly waiting for. Okay. Thank you and. Uh... Best wishes for all the math aspirants. The number is 150 now. And that too in an evening, a Saturday evening, 150, you know, fresh brains are joining together for a discussion, mass discussion on uh, the, your prospects, where you want to do your PhD, why you want to do PhD. Uh, I will take one or two minutes to uh, just uh, went back, uh, you know, 43 years back. When I started my uh, PhD, uh, we didn't have, you know, uh, we didn't have anything. What we had was just blackboard and uh, paper, pen. We had to communicate uh, through air mail. I, I'm sure that you, not, you should not have seen this. Aerogram or air mail, send a letter uh, abroad, wait for three months to get a reprint. Okay. So only after getting the reprint, we can start reading the basic material. Another letter, it will take another three months. And if this person is not receiving this letter, we don't know whether he's alive or uh, uh, dead. Uh, alive or dead, no, nobody knows. No response. So we have we had very little what's called uh, facility for uh, what's called literature survey, and our only tool was uh, math reviews. Okay, mathematics reviews of American Mathematical Society. Still, you get it, uh, printed version also, online version also. And notices of American Mathematical Society and some German publications was the only available source. You will not believe, uh, you will never believe that I started my research in 1980 with a junior research fellowship of 300 rupees, which was increased to 450 rupees after one year and 600 rupees for my senior research fellow. I was a CSAR fellow. Okay. 
and the first uh, paper which I published in 1994, I, I didn't have the opportunity to see it in print because that came in discrete mathematics, which is very, very expensive journal. Uh, so the, it was not available in even in Cochin University and very few institutions in India had this copy. So the first uh, actually seeing my own paper printed was when I went abroad in Budapest. So I was really excited to see my name in a print form with my student. And I will spend one second more to inspire you. That happened in 1994. And that was actually his thesis and this paper was a solution to a conjecture. OK. And we left some gap. And you'll be surprised to know that 2024, that is after 30 years, February issue of discrete mathematics contains a research paper by six mathematicians from USA with just two references in their list, two of my papers. Okay, that happened 30 years ago. There is more surprise. Okay, in the last part of this problem uh, paper, they have posed two problems that they couldn't solve. Basically, the problems I work in graph theory, and the problem is looking at uh, each vertex of the graph and look at the number of triangles containing that vertex. If a graph has equal number of triangles with respect to every vertex, I say that it is a triangle regular or something like that, just like, just like our regularity. Okay, so the, the problem, this paper has two problems. One of them is something about the construction of such graphs, which this group of people didn't get. I am going to focus on the technology now available. I shall repeat this paper published in 1920, sorry, 2024 February. I got it in 2023 November because you know when it appears in online, I can see this. Right. So now concentrate on what I'm going to sell. 2023 November I saw, and I somehow felt that this problem one could be solved, of course, not alone with the help of my uh, friends so i communicated this problem to all my friends abroad from uh, some of them earlier collaborators and so on and that's where the technology helps one of my friends in now in uh, basically in serbia dragon stevanovic he is now in dubai he liked this problem and he communicated with uh, two three us people and canadian people and who required a lot of you know technical skill and we are extremely happy to tell you that that problem only solved now. Before the paper actually came, that is what I want to stress. The paper came only in February 24. We got the copy in November 23. We focused for three months in January 24. Before the paper is published, we have solved the problem. And we have just communicated this. It's a very, very hard construction of graphs. And there is no sub graph generator, some, some software package by which if you give the properties, it will generate all the graphs with that property. I didn't know that about that, but so some technical experts helped it. So what I want to conclude is that this is the speed with which technology helps in doing research. And uh, uh, especially for students from Kerala, they have started thinking about going abroad. That itself is a positive sign. When I uh, recommended uh, Rosna's case, Rosna was, you know, uh, physically and intellectually and uh, everywhere she was ready okay i will go that may be the reason maybe the reason may be that his father is also a mathematics teacher that background is there otherwise you cannot expect a Cochin university student to go to austria and do phd but that has changed over the last six years i can show that oh Ro rosna is there in austria why can't you go to austria or nearby places slovenia slovakia or some other place okay so now the community abroad those students who wanted to do PhD is increasing. And also students from Kerala joining other institutions in India. Long back, my, you know, Suri of okay, ISI Bam Bam Bangalore is a very, very, very good friend of mine, long-standing friend of mine. I told, uh, Suri told me, Vijay Kumar, why can't you send some students to ISI Bangalore? We don't have students. And I'm telling you about this story 25 years ago. So I used to tell this my, to my students. They said, no, no, Bangalore. How can I go from Cochin to Bangalore for higher studies? No, that is impossible. That was the attitude. Okay, but that has changed a lot. 
technology has, has a lot. You will not go to the journals. Journal will come to you. Uh, that's what is something very exciting. And uh, I wish the such, all success for such programs because uh, I look at a situation where each university in abroad contains a faculty from Kerala or from India. That is something a very, very distant dream because there are more than 1,000 universities abroad, at least best of them. I find an Indian student, Indian faculty, of course, Indian faculties are there in Princeton, Stanford, all these things. Uh, but uh, those who have been members of these math aspirants after 10 years proudly say that this is because of math aspirants that I am here. I am here in Princeton as a colleague of Manjul Bhargava or uh, as a colleague of Sandar Rajan in Stanford. That's a distant dream. And I wish uh, all the very best to all of you. Have a dream first. Then try to uh, achieve that dream. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Vijay Kumar, sir. It was so insightful. And thank you so much for sharing the experience and giving us the best blessings. All right. So we're going to enter into today's event. OK, so we can we can have um, the panel introducing themselves. And also, like I said, it would be great if uh, you can tell about the application process, selection, fellowships, part-time coursework, and uh, need of any language proficiency exams, job placement opportunities, and any other relevant information that you think is a fundamental thing for the audience to listen. So to the audience, um, I just recommend if you could make some notes, it would be really useful for you because uh, each person is uh, going to share you lots of information and uh, for the one you want if you make a little bit of note it will be easy for you to uh, participate in the second segment brilliantly so first i'm going to welcome dr uh, rosna paul and uh, she is from technical university grass austria i'm so so excited to uh, start the discussion start our program and uh, here is our first panel member uh, welcome on behalf of everyone here. Welcome, Rosna. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Rosna Paul, and I am um, completed my PhD recently uh, in September from uh, TU Graz, uh, Graz University of Technology from Austria. Um, I was a, a former um, master student of Ambat Vijayagumasar, so that's why he mentioned me. Um, so. When I thought about going abroad, um, I was already finished my master's. And during my master's period itself, um, Sir Ambat uh, Vijayakumar Sir always asked me, why, why can't you go to abroad? But at that period, when you look at your um, colleagues or seniors, nobody has gone abroad. So it um, seems like a very distant dream, or I'm not sure whether I was fit there. That was the first um issue and the second one is that i even though i studied everything in english i never tried to speak in english um, so in at least in coaching university we try to give presentations in english but apart from that for all the classes i mean uh, if you talk with your teacher or students you are speaking in your regional language uh, you are not speaking english so uh, Initially, my fear was that whether is it possible for me to live abroad with my language level. Uh, so that was the first question. And the second one was, uh, will the family allow to go there? Uh, so at that moment, after getting PhD, I mean, after getting the admission letter from TU Graz, I asked to uh, ask my family whether they will allow me to go. Uh, initially, there was a slight issue because uh, for me, they think it's also possible for me to do PhD in India, then why I should go abroad. Then actually, I had to make a call between my family and Vijay Masa to <laughs> convince them to let me go to abroad. So these factors was there. But I think now the situation has changed much. There are many people who are going abroad and you can ask um, how the things are, how the life there, and it's more easy to get more information. So I, I think you have to use this um, opportunity. So I'm not uh, bragging much, <laughs> so I will go to the admission uh, procedure. So I joined um, for PhD in 2019. Uh, at that time, there was a call uh, or an application call for doing PhD, and it is under the project of discrete mathematics. 
so this project is a, a big project it can uh, it has um, several openings uh, for example this is not just one project it's a collection of uh, projects so the overall term is the discrete mathematics but it contains projects for craft theory uh, commutative algebra and several other fields like optimization and a lot of things and they put an advertisement uh, in the web page and uh, all the things i mentioned there what all things you have to do for getting admission so mostly what you have to do is that you should uh, have a cv um, uh, academic cv in this case and should have a, a motivation letter or a covering letter so here i would like to stress that in the covering letter you should really specify which project you have to get into and only specify the things which is uh, suitable for this position so if you if you have some background um, projects done or background studies done um, you have to mention it in the covering letter and also your enthusiasm towards this um, uh, project so you really know what is going to happen and you you are uh, excited about doing it and after this uh, sending all the documents your transcripts uh, degree certificates then motivation letter covering letter they will list everything in their website so you have to make uh, a copy of everything and send it to their email address and after that i think i'm i didn't re really remember how long it took but after one month i guess they sent me back an interview call uh, in the interview call they have mentioned that if you can come to austria for interview that is better or you can uh, do an online interview so I prefer to come to Austria so that I can see the department and I can talk with um, my future um, guide and so on. Um, so I came here and I had a um, around a 15 to 20 minutes interview. Uh, there I have to pre make a presentation. So I already know I have to give a presentation. So I prepared a presentation about my previous project and I uh, explained it very briefly. Don't have to go into details. And then they asked me, uh why do you choose this um, course or why are you interested in so there is no any sort of technical questions uh in the interview but usually a general questions whether you fit into a research role or are you able to do do research kind of questions so during the interview i also got a uh, chance to talk with my guide so i mean after the interview there are um uh, at least 12 people were there for the interview so each one get one slot and in between breaks you can talk to other people there so that was also a good opportunity to want to communicate with them kind of one-to-one -one contact and um, then i came back to india and after one or two months i guess uh, they sent me the admission letter then it's the whole visa process and other things um, and then uh, i came to austria for um, um, some of uh, the winter intake uh, my uh, contract started from october 1st so this project was for um three years uh, in uh, um, i mean in the contract it's actually for three years but there was a clause inside that if you can do um, a research abroad for six months research abroad means you can work anywhere outside of austria you can go to germany maybe or some other places if you uh, if you're able to do that for six months then you will get one year plus so totally you will get four years plus the six months abroad so six months abroad is also included in that so i went to 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 you berlin and a few berlin which is in germany and then i also went to mexico and altogether i have more than six months of abroad stay so i get extra one year and this one year i mostly used to write my thesis and finish out things so altogether i took exactly four years so i joined on october 1st and i finished on september 30 so it was a correct one year uh, so that was the whole academic uh, journey and one good thing with these projects is that uh, this project comes under funding so you don't have to look for any funding you already get a funding but it's not a fellowship in general but it's a salary so you are a, a taxpayer in austria that is also a good thing because after your phd you will uh, you started with the settlement permit to researcher as a visa or the rp and when you finish you will become a red white red plus card holder and even after you finish your phd you can still stay in austria 
uh, for another one or two years because uh, it depends on the validity of your residence permit. And at that time, you can search for jobs. So it's an open job market kind of uh, residence permit. And so during your PhD, you are not allowed to do any part-time jobs. So I'm not covering any part-time job cases here. And the next point is coursework. OK, uh, for PhD, for our uh, setting, coursework was necessary. Uh, but you don't have to take it in the first year itself. You can choose uh, in the span of four years, you can take some courses and finish it during this span. So it's not um, particularly in the first year or second year. You can take courses in any time you want and you can finish it at any time you want. Uh, so there are some ETS points, credits you have to fulfill, but um, altogether, uh, you only have to take three courses, two main courses and one elective. So it's not a very hectic coursework. Um, then language proficiency. Okay, uh, for any master, for example, master's program or PhD programs, I think uh, if the program is in English, uh, you can uh, get an ILTS uh, certificate or TOEFL. But even if you don't have it, uh, you can uh, get a certificate from a university called MOI that you have studied uh, your previous degree in English. So that certificate is actually enough for getting in admission for the English taught courses. PhD is mostly always in English, but for masters, there could be um, courses in uh, German also. For that, for that case, you need the German proficiency. But for English courses, I think you can uh, get into it with these certificates. And then job placement, uh, it's a bit tricky question uh, because if you don't have a German proficiency, uh, then it's it's a bit difficult to get into the job industry. But if you just have to want to survive in Austria, uh, it's okay if you don't have a German proficiency. So I'm still in the A2 level of German. I uh, when I came here, I don't I didn't know any any German. I started learning after coming here, but I still didn't um, um, learned that much <laughs> because it is a bit tricky to learn uh, German together with the research. But after your research, you can go for this intensive German classes and so on. But living in Germany, yes, you need German, but it is not compulsory. But I will suggest you to learn German. If you have time before coming to Austria, then try to learn German. That is the best thing. Uh, even if you come to Austria, then uh, you can learn it here. But uh, if you have some knowledge before, that is good. But I'm not saying that if you don't have it, you will fail. No, you can still survive. If you have enough um, uh, colleagues to support you, then you can uh, do it. Uh, it's not a big issue, but it, I always suggest you to learn it. Uh, and OK, there are budget for expense. OK, uh, for PhD, there is uh, you don't have to show any budgets or anything because you are paying. So they are providing you the salary. So since they are providing you the salary, you are also covered with the insurance. So you don't have to get any insurances to stay in uh, Austria. And also you don't have to show any fundings. But I would suggest you to show some fundings to get the visa process. I mean, uh, so they are a bit skeptical about you. Uh, and so what I did is that I took an affidavit from my parents that they have these funds. And if something happens, they will take care of all the funds kind of things. But it is not necessary. But I put it there because to ease up the visa process. Uh, so when, when you're coming for PhD with a um, salary, uh, things are very easy. You don't have you don't need any insurance in Austria because the insurance is a public insurance, which is already getting to the uh, I mean, it all also come in the package of your salary and uh, the salary could be something around 1,900 euros in the beginning. And um, then uh, in each year, there will be a slight increase. But you should remember that the gross salary and the net salary, they are different. So in the even if you see a big salary amount in your contract you might get a half of it because of the taxes insurance and everything so but um, you don't need any additional salary to um, survive so uh, you will so you can pay the rent and everything with the salary you get from the um, phd 
and uh, somebody asked about the uh, pre-recorded. Uh, sorry, sorry, I was not to interrupt sorry. you. Okay. Uh, I think we can answer the questions in the interactive second segment so okay. that uh, other people also can get some time for introducing themselves and talking about okay. the basic things. Yeah, sorry but, for taking uh, time. Yeah, but uh, have you finished your um, details, the, the fundamental details? I have, these are the main things I have to All say. Right. Mm -hmm. That was great. And one thing I want to note that you bothered about the English language when you wanted to go for a PhD. And now you have a very yeah. beautiful English communication. <laughs> thank you. I'm still not confident, but <laughs> thank you for but it. Sounds really confident to us. All right. And thank you so much. It was uh, really genuine. And I, I like to say more. I think all the panel members here you have are going to be very friendly and honest and genuine. You won't get this kind of information from anybody else so have your ears very sharp and listen to the rest of them now i'm gonna i'm gonna welcome meenakshi verma uh, from max planck institute magdeburg germany hi meenakshi please unmute yourself uh, hi 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 so first i think you need to tell me how to read it magdeburg is it magdeburg yeah that's it okay <laughs> <laughs> Welcome okay. and yeah, the stage is all Thank you so now. much. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, good afternoon or good evening <laughs> to everyone. Uh, so, okay, for me, um, actually, uh, I, it was like for me, it was pre decide to do PhD from foreign for me. So, during my master's, I applied for summer internship and uh, i i got into the vsrp that is in tfer and i attended vigyan vidushi also in tfer only and there like i interacted with the, okay vsrp was one to one correspondence like it was kind of project only and uh, uh, vigyan vidushi was like we were interacting with some professors and all these things so it was like okay it was confirmed for me that i have to do uh, PhD from abroad only and uh, then I did my master's project I did my master's from IIT Bhuneshwa and I did my master's um, uh, in numerical multilinear algebra master's project Hi, Minakshi. I think some connection issue with that. Yes. So, uh, all right. So, I think she will be joining again. Right. She has joined. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> you can carry on. Thank you. So, so, uh, yeah. So, where was I? Yeah. So, I did my master's in numerical multilinear algebra and I started uh, sending application from December onwards. For this, I need one CV. Uh, as Rosna told that previously we need one um, CV and motivational letter and you must have three um, professor for recommending you because after your application they'll ask you for the recommendation letter. Uh, so yeah, um, so I started applying from January. I just completed all these things that like motivational letter and CV and all these things from till December and then applying from January and uh, like i was just looking for like who is working in my field and all these things i was searching on google and then i was just sending the application like uh when there is university position i was sending like this also and if there is position like under professor i was like uh, seeing that it was matching with my master's things uh which i am doing right now and which seems interesting to me so i was sending application like this and then i got one uh like Okay, yeah, I got a call in between that and then I got call from Max Planck Institute. And then uh, they told me, they called me for an interview and in which I had to present my master's project. Um, in such a way, like, why I suit their team?
sorry, love. I think you are muted for the moment. I'm sorry, I don't know what it is happening. <laughs> Some technical list. That's all yeah. right. Please carry on. Yeah. So uh, they called me for an interview. Um, okay. I don't know what till when you heard me. <laughs> Oh, so I think you will just just carry on the last sentence you were telling us. Yeah, oh. so they called me for an interview, and in the panel, like there were five to um, six people were there, like one main professor and their team leaders were there, and they asked me questions about my master's project and some like normal questions why I want to do PhD from their institute, what uh, what what plan is there for me, and then after one week I got the invitation letter from there and then the yeah, complete like uh, visa process was there like to proceed and uh, okay because i'm doing my phd from research institute so i don't have to do any uh, um, uh, coursework and i don't have to take uh, this like uh, what is called tutorial and anything like I'm not bound to take anything. I don't have any responsibility because it's a research institute. In general, in Germany, it's not like that. If you are enrolled in university, then you have to do uh, some like uh, tutorial. Tutorial. They have to take some tutorial. I guess I I I'm not sure about it, but I don't have to take. And uh, um, yeah, in Europe, I guess. Or in Germany, basically, if you are enrolling for PhD, then you don't need any language proficiency. And uh, because I started my PhD from uh, like um, September last year, right? So I don't know about this. Like, I'm not sure about this job placement opportunity. I can't say. But for, like, whatever I interacted with pe people, whatever I know is like, it's very difficult to get into the German academia without having the German knowledge of German language. But uh, like because I am from applied mathematics, so there is job opportunities in like companies and all these things. And because in my group, people are working in machine learning and artificial intelligence things, stuff like this. So it's like for my group, it's very uh, like not easy, but yeah, it's possible to get into the job in Germany also. Um, and what other things are there? I guess I covered all these things. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, Meenakshi. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your patience. With thank the you. <laughs> thank right. you. Okay, now I'm going to welcome the last person, I think, from Germany. So this is um, Ashwadi Baiju from University of Gottingen, Germany. Yeah. Hi, Ashwadi. Hi. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Thank you so much for joining. You're yeah. welcome. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak about the whole application process and all. So um, as Rosna and Meenashi have said, so I guess most of the people might be knowing about the general stuff about the application that. So in my case, what I did was uh, initially I was looking into the universities and uh, into like the specific area which I wanted to like focus on. I find out my my area and in the university's websites, I was looking for a possible future advisor. So in that search, I found out one thing about specifically about Germany. So that is actually called DAAD. Uh, it's a scholar. It's an organization which provides scholarship. I think um, I should focus. I mean, I should stress more on this thing. So basically, I am a DAAD scholar. Uh, so the, there are many advantages for either for a master's student or for a PhD student who's coming as a DAD scholar student when you're coming to Germany. Like, uh, of course, you will be getting some good amount uh, so that in master's or in PhD, you don't have to do some other part time job or something like that. And also uh, it will cover all your tax and insurance, so which will be like a good, quite a good amount. And yeah, so uh, and also. Uh, to me, what happened is I just came last October. So October is a period where people will be rushing to countries and especially to countries like Germany. So it's really, really difficult to get to all this visa process and get all these things done. So but when you are a DAAD scholar, this DAAD organization will help you to get into the uh, visa process and to make it very faster. 
so that really helped me in my case because i was not even getting a visa slot i mean visa interview slot but there i contact and i mailed them about my situation and then immediately they responded and they contacted indian embassy or something like that so i i i just got a slot from with the help of them so and also in terms of visa uh, so you don't have to pay the visa fees or something that will cover all these things so i guess uh, so everyone who is looking into like who have a plan to come to germany i would definitely suggest looking into the this website so it's called uh, german academic exchange service dad uh there are a lot of scholarships for each um, things and meet for many courses also for masters and yeah that thing and about the coursework so uh, basically i have to do some coursework but it's not that hectic kind of a thing it's sort of like 30 credits thing so which you you have to take like maybe three or four courses throughout like by the end of your program phd program and you have to be a teaching assistant for at least one course and also it's like um, maybe you should go into some conference and give uh, a poster or like give a talk but these things i guess um, i guess most of the phd students will be doing at least by the end of their phd program and about german so i guess some of the students some of the people have also asked about german about the language german so basically i have no idea about german language at least till now but of course i have the plan to take a german course uh, so this dad will again fund you for taking the intense uh, german courses so um, yeah so that will be quite a quite a good amount if you are taking like a if you are going into a goita institute or taking a Ger intensive course but uh, this uh, again this dad will help you for that so they will give you extra amount if you are planning to do that thing so i am planning to take it either in my second semester or something because initially i was not able to do that so, uh, so i guess so I, i mean at least right now i don't have a problem with not knowing german at least in the uh, department or in the university but if you're stepping out if you're going into some shops or i mean for our daily life it will be really helpful if we you know some at least some basic stuff of german and about the job placement that i also i'm just a first year phd student so i also haven't explored that area much but i guess there are more options here and yeah about toefl so i have uh, i have applied to i mean i have uh, i've written this toefl exam while applying to dad i guess you might be needing some sort of um, uh, confirmation like either the toefl or gre or maybe as uh, as rosna said some certificate from your university or something saying that your medium of instruction is english or something like that but i guess that is more it's something like the either gre or toefl or this certificate at least one of this clarification is required i guess so uh, maybe i will stop right now and yeah okay thank you so much ashwadi it was so pleasant you were smiling throughout so nice to see that and now i'm i'm going to welcome the next panel member but before that two things so those who have raised your hands please lower it unless you don't want to say anything and uh, yeah please lower your hands not raise lower your hands and when somebody is speaking please mute yourself that's very important but you can always show the reactions using the emo emojis in the google meet that would be very very nice if you can do that now i'm going to welcome uh, rakhal baburam from michigan state university united states welcome rakhal thank you uh, firstly thank you for this opportunity uh, and as uh, she said i'm rakhal from michigan state university i'm a first year phd scholar uh, and i'll give you a brief summary about how a phd in the us looks like and about the general application procedure so uh, so first thing that i think is very important is a major distinction between a phd in europe and a phd in the us so the phd in europe is generally for 3 to 4 years and a phd in the us on the other hand is a 5 year program so if you are a person who has already fixed the area of interest so you you know that you are going to do do something along the lines of symplectic geometry or something like that then i think and you don't want to do mandatory basic coursework and you just want to you know go into research then i think 
Europe would be a good option for you. And on the other hand, if you're a person like me, who has not fixed what area you want to do things. And so I, I had decided on topology, but I did not know what in topology. So I, I, I wanted to explore further. So for, for the, those reasons, I chose US because you get to explore in the first two years. You don't even have to choose your advisor till the beginning of your third year. So that there's a certain flexibility there. So in the first year, essentially, you will have basic coursework. So you'll have to choose three out of maybe five or six, six streams. So you'll have to do maybe algebra, real analysis. So there'll be all basic courseworks in the first year where you'll have to clear the exams. And the second year comprises of uh, you choosing a potential advisor and forming a committee. And uh, you'll be reading a certain number of books, maybe two or three books, and there'll be a viva and an exam based on that. These are known as the comprehensive exams. And the third year is after your comprehensives, you essentially choose your advisor. So that is, in general, how the program goes. So what happens after the third year, I'll let you know after my third year. So uh, now I'll just talk a bit about applications. So in case of the US, the applications start late November to early February. So do note that anything, so even if you're doing a master's thesis, Whatever you do till that point of time, November would be the one thing would be the thing that matters. Because after that, you whatever you do that won't be going to the application. So uh, keep that in mind. Be a bit proactive about it. And so the criteria in general is so firstly the TOEFL, the something that can show your proficiency in English. Um, it could very well be I IELTS. I think most of the universities have said both of the test and uh, on the other hand some universities do accept uh, i mean some of the universities exempt certain universities from TOEFL or IELTS for example Northwestern had exempted IISC, ICER Kolkata, uh, ICER Pune or things like that so there many universities are exempted so you may want to look at that list as well uh, on the other hand one thing that I would like to emphasize is that Certain universities have a certain speak speaking score that is required to be met. So you should keep that in mind while giving preparing for your TOEFL or IELTS. The other general tests are GRE general and GRE subject, which is mostly avoided by most of the universities. So uh, most of the time, you don't need to give it. So I won't focus much on that. Uh, the other important thing is the letter of recommendations. This is very important because you'll be writing a lot of things in your application. You'll be writing your statement of purpose. Your statement of purpose will include things that you have done in your master's, things that you have thought about, and whatever letters of recommendations your professors write, this has to back most of the things that you write in your master's, uh, write in your SOP. So if you say that you have read these things under this professor, the professor has to back that in his letter of recommendation. That is important. And the letter of recommendations in general is three in number. So out of which I would say two should be personalized and one should be like generic. If both, uh, if all three are personalized, that's good. So by personalized, I mean the professor should know you very well from a recent past. And by generic, I mean it could be a an instructor who taught you taught you a course or something. So, uh, for example, one would be would be your master's project advisor, say, and then another one could be someone who whom you did a reading project under, and the other has could be your course instructor who knows you very well. So uh, that is about the letter of recommendations, and another thing is the SOP, the statement of purpose. So this is essentially a chance you get, well, the only chance you get to connect with the admission committee, because this is the genuine thing that you are writing, and that is being read by the committee. So this is your place to sign. So you could essentially write about whatever reading that you did. But I think throughout your bachelor's and master's, it's important to think about more stuff. 
even if it is very minute, even if it's some very minute question, even if it's uh, given a theorem, there could be a lot of initial conditions in the theorem. You could alter a specific initial condition, ask whether that question, the theorem still holds, or something like that. You should keep on thinking about these things. And your thoughts can actually be written in the SOP. And that actually has a lot of value because you are able to, so the chem committee is able to understand that, OK, you have a specific, uh, you know, you, you can think like that. Or you know, even if it is very minute. So that's something I think is a very good thing to write in your SOP. Uh, and other than that, the next thing are the transcripts and CV. Transcripts are a, are a bit tricky in the sense sometimes we, we have to send it unofficially through email. That is fine. Sometimes we have to send it officially, which requires extra money. So uh, do look into all that and plan your budget accordingly when you're, when you're applying to the US. So the last one, one more thing that I wanted to say is that, uh, yeah, US is expensive. You would definitely need a stipend. So, uh, but don't worry, all the universities, at least most of the universities uh, provide TA ships. So you could essentially teach and get the money. Uh, and very rarely I have seen some offers where you don't get uh, TA ships. On the other hand, there are also fellowships. Be careful to look for that because the fellowships deadlines are potentially earlier than the original institute deadlines. For MSU, it was on December 1, the fellowship deadlines, and January 20 was the in institute deadline. So you have to look into all that. And well, uh, about job placement, uh, well, most of the job placements are indeed postdocs. But th there are definitely other job placements in the US. We often have workshops here uh, offered by our institute, uh, I mean, telling us about the potential jobs we could have. So one thing that you should keep in mind is that the mathematical training that you receive as a part of your PhD is of huge value. So that the kind of thinking that you get is, is, is something that has great value. So this could end up yeah, uh, being useful in industry. This could end up being useful in scientific advisor positions, or there are many, many positions. Uh, another job opportunity would be teaching, which is also in demand. But you'll have to plan your PhD accordingly. If you're going to want to teach a lot, then I think you could take up your teaching job. So you have a part-time TA job, right? So you could essentially plan that accordingly. So uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakhal. It was really detailed. And I think you have put a good effort for making this presentation to the audience. That's really appreciated. Now I'm going to welcome uh, Priya Kaveri Vivi from University of Copenhagen, Denmark. OK, I think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm seeing a person from Denmark for the first time. I'm really excited. How is Denmark? Hi. It's OK. How are you? Yeah, I'm How in Denmark. Good. Denmark is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yeah. OK. <laughs> all right. So nice to hear that. Now, yeah, it's all yours. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. So, uh, so I'm Priya. I'm currently a first year PhD student at the University of Copenhagen. So um, first of all, uh, about Copenhagen University in math, we have actually four sections. So one is algebra and geometry. Then we have analysis and quantum. Then third is insurance and economics. And the fourth is statistics and probability. Then we also have two centers. So one center is uh, Copenhagen Center for Geometry and Topology. It's called Geotop. So I'm a part of Geotop. And the second one is a uh, center for quantum maths. It's also called QMath. So uh, this is the math happening in Copenhagen. And uh, we have like two deadlines in a year. So the first deadline is in April 1st. And the second one is uh, November 15th. I think this date is fixed throughout every year. So this is the deadline. And so I applied here in 2023, April deadline. Then after that, I think the application was like, uh, there was a form that I have to fill like the basic details 
then some SOP. I think it was just a box where I have to type my SOP. It's not like I have to upload some PDF or anything. And if I remember correctly, they didn't ask any recommendation. But later, my master's advisor said he received a mail from Copenhagen University uh, asking for the recommendation. So a priori, I haven't given any recommendation. I haven't given anybody's email or contact details, but they found out my master's advisor and they sent a mail. So uh, that was the application process. Then after, I think, after some one month or something, they called for an interview. Then uh, for the interview, it was like for 10 minutes, I have to present my master's thesis. Then they asked some basic question, but all were like math questions, like related to thesis and all. There were no general question like why PhD or why Copenhagen. There were no such question. There were just math questions. And after that, I think after two or three weeks, uh, they replied to me like, OK, there was like a little bit. There was some funding issues and something. And eventually they figured out. And uh, I think it doesn't matter whether we apply in April or November. Uh, the this the starting will be September, October, or November. So I started in November 2023. Yeah, so that is how I got here. Now the second thing is fellowship. So uh, they will provide a salary, and Copenhagen is really really expensive. It, I think it is if you take the most expensive cities in the world, I think Copenhagen will come under 10, top 10. So it's very expensive, but they are providing good salary uh that's enough to survive here so i think in my visa they have also mentioned i can take part-time job but nobody do that here because we are receiving very good salary and that's enough to support ourselves and about the coursework so uh we have to get some 30 credits so each course here is like 7.5 credits so i have to get uh, like pass three or four course and also here it's not a semester system like in India. Here we have block system. So in each year we have four blocks and each block will be eight weeks or nine weeks. So it's like two months. So each course will be only two months. So it's it's kind of easy. In two months you will be done with the course. And also you can take this topic courses like where you have to give some presentation or something. So you don't really have to take the course which has a lot of assignments or like exams or anything. You can also choose that, so it's up to you. And if you attend some master class, so here university will conduct a lot of master class. There are a lot of master class happening that you can check in internet. There are a lot of interesting master class happening in Copenhagen. So on this master class, if you attend, you will get two five credit, like two point five or five credit. So it's not really difficult to get that thirty credits. And uh, and one more thing, like I have to do TA. So uh, T it's like it's not teaching, but it's like a tutorial session. But essentially, I can do whatever I want. I can also teach. So it's like here we have more freedom. So it's like I think we have assigned like two hours or four hours in a week. You can discuss problem or if you want to teach something extra that I want to teach, I can teach that also. So I, have to, I think I have to TA for three or four courses in this end year three year. Then uh, TOEFL, IELTS, we don't need any language uh, exams or anything because here the language is Danish, but most of the students here are international students. So at least in GeoTop, I think there are only two Danish students, but rest everybody is international students and everybody speaks English, so it's not a big deal. And even for daily activities, I think uh, Copenhagen is like most of the people will speak English and only problem that I was facing was uh, in the grocery store. Everything will be written in Danish. So every time I have to translate and see what it is. And also to go somewhere, like in the train, it will be written the stop name. So we will have some pronunciation. But the way they pronounce and the, the way they have written as, you no, know, it's completely different. But and also I think Danish is a very tricky language. So I'm not trying to learn it at least now. But in university, it's completely OK everybody speaks english and about job placement um so i'm i'm working on pure math so but there are students working in industries and all like if you go to that insurance and economics all those groups there are people working in industry and doing phd i don't really know how that works but at least in pure i think most of the people i don't really know many people who are defended phd here but at least the people i know have got some good postdoc positions 
so I think at least in pure math, everybody goes for a postdoc, and I think it's okay. It's it, it's of course difficult to get a postdoc position, but uh, so I don't really know the other job opportunity. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priya. And I really like the fact you shared that uh, in Denmark, people like to take, I mean, take holiday seriously. That, that's yeah. very nice fact to hear. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and thank you so much for your words. Thank you. Now I'm going to welcome uh, Samanvaya R. Bithi. It's an interesting name. Hi, Samanvaya. Right. Uh, so... White. Yeah, it's much better than I've heard from a lot of people. Oh so my God. You. Oh, you are so polite. Samanvaya, she's from Coventry University, England, UK, actually, which is a little bit near for me. I'm from, yeah, I'm from Coventry. And hi, Samanvaya, welcome. Hi. So I would like to clarify that I'm not from maths, but I, I, and I did my master's in the UK. So I would like to just brief on what the master's experience was like and what I've learned about PhD through people and just my experience. Sure, so I think I, sharing, it's going to be useful for the audience. And thank you so me. much. So I did my master's in sustainability and environmental management, which is like a completely different sector. I don't think a lot of people know about it. But uh, UK has three intakes in most colleges, while the bigger, the top 10 ones have only one. So if you go to Oxford, Cambridge, they only have one which is in September. But if you take uh, the next universities, they have one in January, one in May, and another one in September. The September one is the most popular, while there's also in January and May. So you have deadline. You don't have actually deadlines. That's something unique, at least that I saw in you. Coventries, even if you apply late, they're willing to take you for the next intake. But they do have deadlines, and they ask you for a SOP and a letter of, letter of reference and um, things like a transcript and things like that. So your SOP can only be two pages, at least for masters. So that's a deadline they keep, that it can only be two pages. So it's information about who you are, why are you choosing to do what you're choosing to do, and what is like what is your skills on that subject. So it's basically the only source of communication you have with the team who is going to elect you. So it's a bit tricky to put everything into two pages, but that's a restriction we have. The letter of reference can be one or two. I think for me, it was needed to just be one. So I just put one. That's for the application process. And it's same thing like Denmark, people take holidays very seriously. So if you're applying for January and December is around the corner, then you might be a little worried that things are not happening, but they will, even if it is delayed, they usually do it. And there's a lot of relaxation because they do know that December is a very crazy time for people in the UK. So it takes one month, I guess, in most of the universities, I've talked to people with other universities because I knew I had to come here and speak. So everyone has said that it takes a week to get a conditional offer letter, which then has you to submit your financial things and all of that. And then you get an unconditional offer letter. A very important thing about UK is you need to get a cash letter by the university. So for the cash letter, I think it applies to both PhD and masters that you need the cash letter to apply for your visa. So when you have to apply for the cash letter, you actually have to give an interview. Now the interviews have turned mostly AI based in what I've understood. So people, you have questions displayed and you're giving the answer to a presumably no one. So I think that's pretty easy to crack. They don't ask you anything very hard in that. For maths, from what I've inquired from my universities, uh, you do not have any coursework or assignments. While for my course, it was all assignments that I had to submit. But for maths, it's, it's going to be exams, at least for masters. And the fees, I guess, ranges everywhere from like 15,000 pounds, that around 16 lakh Indian rupees to 30 lakh Indian rupees. It depends on which university are you choosing and what are you doing. So as a student for part-time jobs, you get 20 hours per week when you are in the term time. But when you are outside the term time, you get 40 hours a week as a master's student. And I think you can find part-time jobs and you can earn enough to survive, pay your rent because Coventry was a cheaper city compared to London. 
but I guess I am not sure about how the other, you know, other places have part times. But I think Coventry was fine with if you did a part time and you earned enough to survive there. Job opportunity and uh, language proficiency. So for me, I didn't need to write anything, though I wrote eyelids and I got a band. But usually it's 6.5 is the band that you have to get to get into any university. But for me, uh, there are few boards of India that are exempted. So I was from Karnataka State Board, so I was exempted from writing anything. And if I had a 12 English mark over 80, I was fine to not write anything and get into. So that's how I got into. But I think I've not heard TOEFL a lot in the UK. It's mostly eyelids. So I think though both are preferred, I think eyelids is an easier one compared to TOEFL that I've understood. So that's with that. The job opportunities. I cannot speak about it because I myself came back to India because I found better ones here. But from the people that I have seen who live there and who have worked, they do get into stuff. For PhD, from what I've inquired and for the people that I've talked to, you usually have to apply through positions that they open for PhD students. So you have to go on LinkedIn. I've heard that most of it is on LinkedIn or website. And then it's the Application procedure is similar from what I've known, and you get a stipend. But as a master's student, you can't be a TA or a RA in the UK. I've not heard about it, at least from when I've stayed there. But as a PhD student, you do get a stipend, which they say it's enough to survive. While for your funds that you have to show, you have to show whatever your college fees is. And you have a standard amount. I think it's somewhere around 1,000 pounds or 1,200 pounds. It depends on if you're living in London or outside London, and you have to show for it for 10 months to even get your visa approved. So I think I covered most of the things, and that's what I know. So thank you for inviting me here, and hopefully I was helpful in some aspect. Of course, you were helpful, and thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge to all of us. It was wonderful. And um, two things. Now I'm going to welcome um, Visna Mary Eldo from State University of New York, Buffalo, United States, another person from US. So happy to have you here, Visna. But before that, um, I'm going to give the charge of the moderating to Shika Kumari for the rest of the event. Welcome, Shika. And welcome, Visna. Thank you, Ajuna. Thank you. Um, yeah. Again, start rate. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, oh, you're on the go. Okay. Thank you. So, hi. So, as I'm Visna. So, I'm a first year PhD student uh, uh, here in Sunny Buffalo. So, yeah, as like every master student after completing master's, I was like, what to do right now? I was also in that stage. Uh, because main, one main thing was, I did my master's from IIT Palakkad and I didn't had a project. So there may be students who are not doing master's project. So I didn't do any project. So that was a big deal for me because to go to a university uh, for a PhD program, you need a uh, project. So that was one of the negative points that I had at that time. So then what I did was so actually in US, the whole application process requires, I guess, almost like a pre or one year or you have to start your things like for 2024 august if you want to do 2024 fall season then you have to do your process of almost like a one year prior uh, like or one or one and a half years so i took that time to do a project because i need a project so i did it from uh, many of them know squitchin university so i did it from kusat a project then uh, so that was one i did in that one year and yeah so 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 like right now i joined for a project now i want to search for universities the main thing that i first did was i went to us news so news ranking from there i categorized the uh, university ranking and like maybe like a hundred universities or something from that uh one more point i have to mention because i didn't do IELTS, GRE, or TOEFL, or anything. I didn't do any of this quite English test. Main thing is because there was a waiver of this, uh, this things because of the COVID. So I just took that. I don't. I was very lazy to give that exam, so I didn't do that. So <laughs> that was 
it's actually a risk and now i don't think universities i don't know i'm not sure about so uh maybe it's better to write that exams uh, that's my advice because it's a risk actually so don't do that and i don't think they have waived it right now because that was for covid and i know one more exam so but i'll tell i took a duolingo exam duolingo many of them heard of so i took that exam that was cheaper and it's also valid for two years and all this english test i don't know about ielts here everything is valid for some years i guess hopefully and yeah so this all are these uh, things i didn't do so i uh, so i started one and half pre or like a 2022 may i started searching about universities i listed a hundred university or something then i went to i am from a pure background but i'm doing phd in applied background so that is one of the things so i when i was sure that i want to do an applied uh, so what i did was i did some internships in applied side like neural neural science or neural networks uh, and all such stuffs so that was one of the thing that helped me to get into the applied side because i'm from pure i can't directly say oh i'm interested in your subject no so i want to do show my interest right so i was doing that things so that is one of the thing then i ranked the universities i found this mural or uh, i working in network theory okay so network theory uh, professors i uh, i went to the university website i first of all check whether they waived gre or ielts or not so i went to that universities first then i went to their uh, department i saw the professors list then I found, uh, keep in mind to find professors, if you are interested in a particular area, then try to keep like in your university, at least two professors or three professors are working in that area. If either one rejected you, you can work with other one. So like, uh, keep it in mind that. So that is one of the thing. And then, uh, so I ranked them. Then I categorized it into, I got a, from my friend, I got to know that you have to have a three type of category. So one is like your best, like your dream university. I didn't have any dream university like MIT or not because I didn't have that much experience and to get into that university. So, but we have a like a good quality of like I kept like like a uh, some like two or three two or three universities I kept in like my dream university level. Then like an average or above average level universities that like I if. I get into it. So, okay, good. So I'm in that safe zone. Uh, then, then my third one was a safe zone. Like I'm sure that I get into. I can how I categorize this depending upon the acceptance rate. If I say, but it's not true because then I guess the acceptance rate is depending upon the engineering or like masters things. I guess it's not for PhD. It doesn't affect that much, but maybe. So I I did it like that way. So uh, that was the thing. So this all I did, I categorized, I just divided my three universities. I went through and I emailed to professors because as like I said, I, I, I do know that like I wish to do in this area. So I just emailed to many professors. Many of them didn't reply. One of the thing as him uh, previously, I think uh, somebody else mentioned. So it was like, uh, it's a, it, as like Europe or thing, this is a five-year program. So it's a, there is a program committee or something like a group of people who select us. So we don't, we won't get in, we can't, if we email also professors can't do many things because they will reply to us, please apply to the program. It's nice to hear that you are interested in my topic. You please apply to the program. We can see further if you get selected. That's only they will say, they won't say anything more. But there are some professor, I got some good replies, like uh, right now I'm working with. So that professor told, he was not in the committee, but he told me like, yeah, it's good. You can keep your name in, in your SOP. This is what he, that's a very big deal. Like when you're preparing your SOP, like statement of purpose, you can keep his name. I have contacted him and we are, he has, we are willing to work together and all. And he, uh, that is a one plus point. Uh, mostly they can't do anything but if you get this type of a reply that is a good point so it's better to email them and expect that many of them won't reply and and if you uh if you email them try i heard of but i'm not sure about this try to email if you have an official email id like your institute email id rather than your gmail or or in your personal email ID, because i think it will go to their spam folder so they can't see your emails so that is one of the things. So these all you have to do prior to your like like that beginning stages, like emailing professors, selecting universities, 
getting with your GRE, IELTS, TOEFL, and all such things. IELTS or TOEFL, anything is enough. This is for English proficiency. Then uh, each university have their own cutoff, I guess, means probably by 6.5 or 7 in IELTS. But as I said, I didn't do it, so I'm not sure about all such things. So that is all the thing ranking and all. Then, uh, then we'll start up. I think the application will start by October. Hopefully, yes, October or like August, October time. And many of the universities, it will end by December and January, like the uh, mid December or the beginning of January. And you will re start receiving offers from February till, I guess, April, mid April, or hopefully, like that is the period of time. So, these all are the things uh, you have in, as an application process, of what I did also. Then, um, then like financial support, like it is like, uh, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, it's it's through TA, teaching assistantship. So uh, you will get your funding, you will get your uh, uh, tuition fees is paid by them, health insurance is paid by them, and you'll get a stipend for a month, uh, like per month. And one more thing in US, it's for nine months, I guess. Hopefully, yes, for me, it's nine months. So it's for stipend is for nine months because summer, it's a break. And especially where Mac students, we don't have to go into any labs. We can work at any places. So it's like just, and our process also will, as like everybody said, it is like they take everything serious like holidays they are holidays and holidays many of them except except asian professors they will work for 24 hours if they can do that <laughs> that is the thing and like yeah uh, so that is the thing and when you're emailing your professors see the timing and email them because uh, like now it is daytime here so try to email them like that so that your email won't go down so that they will make sure that they will see that things so keep in mind that thing then so this is how that okay i mentioned forgot to mention that so okay so funding is like that you don't have to do anything outside uh your department or any other jobs this is how we are getting funded we are not allowed to because of this f1 visa we have to work like this like we will get the ta and some universities there is ras but that you don't get at i don't think max students will, especially if you are in pure side or something ras are bit hard even applied also it is hard <laughs> it's hard it's hard so uh that you get once you are into the program maybe you can talk with your professor if you will get then you don't have to do any ta duties or anything you don't have to teach students you don't have to grade papers just take your money and do your research that's it then then that's it then job opportunities as like i also think it is postdoc is the a big thing that is in front of me too like thing uh yeah i think it's again depending upon pure or applied because pure i i am not sure about how is the job opportunity so i i don't know what to say about that but applied you have like uh there are many industrial jobs again you don't have any campus placement or anything you have to find by yourself you have to search about things in linkedin or wherever you want to and yeah hopefully i should also do that anyways but that is there are a lot of there is a lot of time for me so like software i statisticians and maybe health areas so this is this is what i'm speaking from my area like network theory or even your statistics or probability related people student even pd students uh can have industrial or financial pds are there so such type of insti uh industries are there so you can go to that areas um yeah so like yeah that all are but i'm not have not explored this all are some vague ideas but again we have to find it out uh yeah that's all all, all about that job opportunities so these all are the processes yes i think i'm done with that thank you Lumisna. i <laughs> like the way you just categorize the university as well it was really nice thank you <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so let's uh, move on to the next panel member. Uh, next panel member is Mr. Shubham Jaswal from University of Jayavaskula, Finland. Yeah. Welcome, Shubham. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, you so uh, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, uh, greetings from uh, Finland. I am uh, Shubham Jaswal. I'm a doctoral re researcher in the 
University of Ivaskula, Finland. And uh, my story is also same as Rosna's story. What, what she explained in the beginning is uh, pretty much same story. And the only change is it happened in Uttar Pradesh, not in Kerala. And uh, so uh, now uh, I I want to go directly to the uh, main points which uh, which I uh, I want to mention. So here in my university, I think there are there are broadly three areas. One is uh, one is called geometry and analysis and uh, second is probability and the third is statistics and there are many topic wise research areas in these in these uh, uh, three options and i belong to this uh, geometry and analysis where uh, mostly i i am supposed to do this non linear pd or differential geometry stuffs which i am still trying to understand and uh, uh, coming to the eligibility part for PhD positions here, you need a master's degree as in India. And uh, addition to that, you need a master's thesis also or a master's project. And they, they want at least to have a grade of three out of five, which and uh, then about the se selection process so the phd positions here are mostly project based which is uh, funded by a group or a project money in which there are some uh, principal investigators and they have to finalize or uh, decide whom to take in or not so the there are two ways one is you can apply directly uh, through the application process which and also uh, this university takes applicants um, two times in a year one is spring and another is autumn the spring time spring applications uh, starts in april every year and the autumn application starts in september so there is a general application process which you can uh, fill with with all these documents of your master degree master thesis and the research statement which is also called an sop and uh, of course the most important thing is your cv and and then they will shortlist you based on their uh, uh, views or based on their points so there are no fixed points which they are going to take from from each year so i think each year they uh, fix some of the points or things which is needed for the project or for the student which they want you to do and second is while while applying to the application while applying to this university in the application process you you will find there are two things you you, you need to say one is like about the course works which is not that important but there are the second thing is about research statement so now now research oh sorry not it, it is a research proposal which sort of something which you are gonna do uh, like about particular problem or some particular area which you have to decide and you have to discuss with one of the potential professors here whom you want to start your your phd so what i suggest is like it is better to have some discussions with the professors before uh, before applying here and it will it will give you like uh, more information and more uh, confidence to apply here also and i think that's how it works and i can say later about a specific application process if uh, someone has question but uh, for the fellowship part 
as as roshna and other uh, panel members panel members says that in in europe the it is not a fellowship system it is a salary system and you 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 are you have to pay taxes and everything and you work as an employee here and for the fellowship part like that uh, the amount of fellowship i would say it's more than enough to uh, uh, like of for your daily expenses and uh, about the part time job i i don't think you need part time job to cover your basic expenses the fellowship is more than enough but if you if if, if you want to do it uh, i'm i'm not sure but uh, i think it is not it, it is not allowed if you are a if, if you are an employee employee of this in, in in university and about the coursework so you have to complete 60 credit points which is i think it is going to reduce to 45 in the next year and The, the the same process works as other panel members said that it's not compulsory to have all these sixty credits in an year. You can you can take courses and you can complete this requirements over the year of your PhD. About language proficiency, this university accepts several uh, certificates. one is ielts toefl there is pt and there is some cambridge proficiency test and there are two i think c1 and c2 i, I don't know anything about it and uh, you can you can also uh, prove your english proficiency by a uh, by producing a certificate from your masters and bachelors institute but they they won't consider that much uh, seriously with those certificate and they will always recommend you to uh, produce some ielts or toefl so the one way is to giving a uh, ielts and toefl and the second way is to producing a, a sort of proficiency certificate from masters and bachelor level there is a third option or also there like uh, the language and uh, communications department here organizes a, a test or generally it's an interview to access your english uh, proficiency but also that is not guaranteed and that is limited for uh, some students i don't know how they fix it but uh, they but they say that it is it is only for limited students it's not for all so i think all the three options are available for you but the most preferred one is to produce an outsource certificate which is ielts toefl pt or uh, uh, duolingo test etc about the job placement opportunity i am also a first year phd student so i don't know much about it but mostly in in my department the graduated phd students and post docs i think more or less they are in the both direction either in academia or or industry some of them are doing post doc some of them are doing jobs in industries specifically i think i think in the sector of r and d and uh, that's it all about it i know about this uh, job placement opportunities regarding the uh, teaching duties i think we almost do not have any teaching duties you just have to supervise some exams i think at most two exams in a semester and that i think it is uh, it's it's not a difficult work you you have to just sit for 3 hours in an exam hall and uh supervise exam other than this you don't need to teach courses you don't need to have uh, to take uh, tutorial sessions about the language part most of the people in locals uh, as well they they do know english and i i i haven't feel any uh, issues uh, in uh, communicating in the university 
and in markets with the locals and any of them like uh, if you if you know like a like some level of english and it's it's okay for you to be here and about the budget and stuff i think you don't need to pay any amount for the application process it's all completely free and what else i think uh, for, uh, for now is it's i i am done and i can i can answer to the specific ones if if they want to thank you shubham it was really clear it was really clear, short, and to the point description. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. As of now, uh, we are ending with all our panel members. So I would like to request uh, that if any panel member would like to add any new information uh, till now, they have a chance. If you want, you can. I think so. All are done. Yeah, all are done with the information. So today it seems like uh, our participants got a huge amount of inform uh, information, motivations, and uh, I'm sure that they're going to bash the coming admission sessions. Thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Can I, can I ask one question? Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So we are about to start. So let's wait for your turn. Okay. Can I ask? Uh, we uh, we will give you the chance. Wait, okay, wait okay. for it. Yeah. So, thank you, everyone. Right now, we will open after the presentation from our panel members. We will open the floor for the Q and A sessions. So, all the participants, now it's your turn. Please be ready to ask question. Just pick up each and every queries, doubts from every corner of your mind, whether any questions related to the admission process or any doubt you have till now, you can ask. Our panel members are here to address you. Okay, so before that, I would like to request all the panel members to first introduce yourself and then, um, uh, and uh, yeah, one more thing that uh, while speaking, keep your cameras on. And uh, uh, one more request to our uh, panel members that uh, please don't hesitate if you want to add anything or conclude in, uh, or um, or you want to include anything uh, in any uh, in each other's responses. You are uh, open to do so. So yeah, we can begin. Yeah, you can start. So let's start with the Prince, Princey. Sorry, Princey. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. My question is, how grades uh, are important for getting admission in abroad, and also, like, how difficult it is to get admission uh, if you haven't done your MSc project nicely. So these two questions: grades and MSc project. How important are they? Is this question specific to any panel member or you are asking to the whole group? Anyone can answer, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, do mention that uh, if you want to ask uh, any specific person, then you can mention that. Or otherwise, anyone who is comfortable can give the answer. So, yeah. Uh, so from my side, um, I think the grades, uh, I don't think that they will check the grades um, a lot. Uh, if you have a um, good grade, I mean, like you don't have to be the top one grade or something. If you have passed everything and you have um, covered all the topics and um, you don't have any backlogs, then I think that is good. Uh, I'm not sure what all topics or what all things they really mention. Uh, but uh, for me, the master project wasn't mandatory uh but uh, i would suggest it if you don't have a master project um if you do have one but keep it there but if you don't have anything i would suggest you to do something like a summer internship or something which shows that you have an affinity towards research so uh, it's not like that you have to be very good at your master project it's just showing that you are 
that direction to show that okay you contacted some person or you already have some experience in researching that is good uh, that is what i think yeah uh, it's i hope others can also uh, add to it also ma'am uh, is publication does publication matters if you have it then that is good but uh, for me i didn't have any publications so during my uh, mphil so for my masters i didn't done any projects so i took the mphil course uh, for one year and for that i have one um, thesis but i didn't have any publication so i i don't think that you need a publication as such but if you have it that is good so you should have something in your cv just to show that you are enthusiastic about research so if your summer projects or if you went for some workshops or you met some person uh, and you have some collaboration so something like that it will uh, benefit you but i don't think that any publication there is no base requirement that you need these many publications so uh, i don't think that publication is necessary but it is good to have it okay ma'am thank you thank you uh, could you uh, introduce yourself uh, yes ma'am uh, i am princey uh, vishwakarma i have completed my masters uh, from central university of south bihar gaya and uh, currently i am taking coaching for uh, jrf but i also want to apply for phd uh, in abroad so i am trying to uh, like gather information and uh, write my sop and research uh, pro proposal and all so okay, okay. thank you pinsi uh, i would like to request no. all the uh, all the participants please first introduce yourself and keep your videos on while speaking okay uh, uh, like as like princey as like cgp criteria i think us has like depending upon university minimum you need a 3 cgp or something 3 or 3.5 i guess yes there is something requirement like that and that depending upon university once you selected university go and check there what all are the requirements you will get to know and like project as like rosna said you try to like uh, at least to show that i am interested in research i am into max or research you should do something uh, like if you don't have a good project you can do an internships and all like that supports that there will be like some support to that thing see as i said i didn't do any project at that point i did an extra project so you can do something like that so that you can uh, build up your cv or your base perfect and yeah that's one of the thing i would like to add one thing uh, so uh, in in case of the cgpa i think the most recent grades that's in the fourth and fifth years if you're doing a masters or if it's a four year bachelors the third and fourth years would uh be more than your pre first two years so um, if you have some grades that are low for those years and if you get a professor to vouch for you in their like rough recommendations that would be good so if they can write that despite so the student had some issues so their grades were low but i believe in he he or her uh, and i believe that they can uh, perform well in this graduate school that would carry some weight so uh, do talk with your uh, advisor and uh, talk about that i think that would help thank you sir okay so next swaroop is there yeah hello okay yeah uh, thank you so much for the moderators for having some, uh, such a wonderful session today so my question is uh, actually uh, i am currently working as an uh, assistant professor in uh, on contractual basis and i am currently looking for a, a phd in abroad i have a, i have kind of a two or three uh, years of uh, drop uh, i have not continued my studies after the masters i have cleared all the exams uh, relevant in india like cis and net um, gate etc et i am looking for the options abroad so my basically my question is uh, uh, how much it affected for a student like me who have a, a two or three drop years 
and uh, what is the the issues of the funding uh, we face during the especially in the uk or uh, europe so as of gap years i don't think it affects for a phd and neither for masters because when i was studying there were a lot of people with even like four five years but if you can still show that you're still interested and that you're already working as a assistant professor on a contractual basis so i think it will not affect your application it would might it might add to your application that you are already teaching and you're interested in research or something like that so especially from uk's point of view from how much i know not that i've done a phd but even from my master's experience having gap years if you can justify and you have been working so that it would not be considered a gap year in that sense but it doesn't affect your application in any way or form so i have just uh, got another question uh, from the minaxi uh... Who is in Max Planck Institute? Uh, I I have already looking for this institute since uh, two three days. Uh, the right. question is, uh, is it? Uh, the question is, uh, I I don't have a master thesis and all. So is it uh, fine or uh, should I work on it? Um. Hi, Suru. Uh. Actually, I don't think so. Like, I'm I am continuing my master's project only. so i don't like i don't have any idea like how can like what will you present in interview then like i presented my master thesis only in my interview and i continued that project only but still you can convince them like um, that you can do in some like in some field they are working in like you are highly interested and you can do well in that so maybe it will Saru, uh, are you satisfied with the answer? Ah uh, yes, uh, yes, kind of yes. So, uh, next, and yeah, yeah. Anyone, anyone want to or oh, can add uh, any other input? It's uh, uh, welcome. Yeah. Any other panel mem member would like to add something? Uh, with the gap, I also think it won't be a much issue because. here in austria also people might go to some other job or take gaps after they are bachelors or maybe after their masters so for research i don't think that they will really uh, look into the gaps but if you are interested then that is good and about the project yes um, if you have something uh, to show that you are interested in research uh, that is good for example if you have some students if so for example if you don't have a project but if you uh, if you are teaching and you have some students and you work together on something uh, that is also good you can just say that oh i work together with this um, students of me on this thing or something like that so just to show them that you are interested in research and you have a capability for doing a research i think that is enough uh, for them uh, i'm not sure for every university for at least you guys i i don't think that they really look into your master thesis uh, and for me what i did in my mphil is very different from uh, what i did in my phd so i think it's fine they only look for whether you are capable of doing research not looking at exactly what you have done uh, for your uh, masters or mphil thesis that is what i think okay thank you rosna so next Member is uh, Singh Priya. Uh, yeah, participants, please uh, make your questions short and to the point because we are limited with the time. So we need yeah. to speed up the session. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask, like, in how many colleges did you apply? Like, what was the I number you decided that I would apply to at max ten colleges or twenty colleges minimum? Uh, so uh, I have applied to I think eight universities. As I said, I divided it into three, three, uh, three groups, and like, uh, like two or three in the first, and uh, then uh, two in the last, then in between also. So it's like it, and each depending upon your budget also. Like they have a for there is a, a like a application fee, and it's so if it is in US dollars, it's. 
a bit high, right? So depending upon what is your budget. So that's how you categorize how many universities you have to apply. So I did almost like an seven and no, eight universities, yeah. Uh, hi, I Priya, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm saying Priya, I have completed my master's from SUNIT Surat. It was an integrated program. OK, nice. So next is uh... Uh, hi, just one thing. Uh, maybe I will just add something. So in Europe, you actually don't have to give an application fees. So it actually depends yeah. on how much time do you have to apply into the universities. So basically, I have applied uh, into like maybe uh, three or four, like it's very less into the number of universities which I have applied. But I have uh, emailed a lot of professors, which in most of the cases you might be replying. You might possibly get a reply about the application process or they will be saying like, OK, I'm already done for this year or something like that. But yeah, if you are looking into say, Europe, you don't have to like think about the financial issues because application is sort of free. So you can you just have to uh, look into the application deadlines and do things on the proper time. Um, regarding that, I wanted to ask, how do you keep track of the application deadline? Like, what is the time application duration in Europe? Uh, it actually varies from university to university, I guess. But mostly, like, if you are like looking for, say, summer intake in April, uh, and also as uh, I guess, uh, yeah, somebody else has said. So, if it is into US, you have to like start things before one or one and a half years, but it's little more better, at least in Europe case. Uh, like uh, I think, so I came here in October, but uh, I applied in the last November or something. So uh, I guess you have to look, always keep a track of the universities which you have to look forward and then always make a spreadsheet or something, like list the things and list the deadlines. And uh, I mean, at least that's what I did so that you will not miss the deadlines. and. Always keep a track of because I cannot set specific date because it varies from university to university, at, at least to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next is Vanshika. Oh, hello, everyone. Oh, my name is Vanshika. Oh, so actually, I, last year I completed my uh, bachelor's. Um, so actually, I want to ask you guys that uh, is it necessary that we have to do a master's in a clean colleges in India, like IITs or NITs, or we can go to the private colleges and then apply for the PhD programs in out of the out of India? Any of the panel members can answer. Um, for me, I don't think that uh, which university you have done your master's is a big issue. Um, uh, but it depends on how do you like write your covering letter or what is in your CV. Uh, I don't think that they are really particular about which university are you from. So I'm from Kusat. I have only done things in Kerala. I never went outside of uh, Kerala for uh, studies. I have done some, uh, in not the internship, some uh, workshop kind of thing. But other than that, I didn't went out of Kerala. But, um, but they actually, if even if I say, if, um, some university names. I'm not sure whether they really know about it. Maybe IITs, they might have heard about it, but I'm not really sure whether they um, uh, what they are. They are not uh, scrutinizing you um, depending on which university you are. It's they scrutinize you only about your um, covering letter or your passion. So if you can show your passion or if you are, if you can prove that you are good at research in some sort way, even if you're studying in a private college, if you can take an internship somewhere and you can show it there, I think that is fine. I, I don't think that you really have to be into the top 10 uh, universities in uh, India to get into a PhD position here. Only it only depends on you. It's up to you. Okay. And uh, they say that uh, IIT's recommendation letter is much more stronger than the private universities. So that's why I got confused that we have to get into some IITs and we'll have some recommendation letters of those IIT professors and then we can go to the PhD programs. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there, I what I suggest is that if you know which area you want to go, uh, try to find someone who has um, some reputation in that area. It it need not be somebody from IITs or top institutions, but it can be someone who really work on that area. Uh, so if you can collaborate with this person or you can do something with that person or get a recommendation letter from that person, that is fine. So they only check whether the person who is giving your recommendation letter is uh, somebody uh, established or, yeah. Um, uh, so they have some uh, good reputation in the area kind of thing. So I don't think that they are really looking at the institution. Even if I talk with my uh, colleagues and uh, my guide or other professors here, they, they only know few institutions uh, in India in which they have collaborated with. So they don't know really what all institutions are in India and these kind of things. So if you could find someone uh, who is good at the area you are going to apply, then consider that and get a recommendation letter. So irrespective of which university he's from. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would like to request the panel member as well as the participants to please make it a little bit brief so that we can cover all the mem uh, all the participants waiting there. The time is limited. So next is Harita. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, Harita. You are. Hi all. I'm Harita. I'm from NIT Calicut. I'm a first year MSc student. Uh, I basically have three questions. What what ex what is the best way to write our SOP? What exactly should be the uh, main things that we could include so we can impress them easily? That is my first question. And the second one is uh, about the visa process. Uh, there will be, uh, what all will be the financial struggles that we'll, we will face on the visa process getting completed. And that's it. So for which region are you looking at? Are you looking at for Europe or USA? Actually, I'm not sure yet. I don't know. That is the right answer. I want to do PhD and I'm interested in going abroad and my field is analysis topology. But I have I have already started looking to it that I don't know right exactly what I want. Uh, for at least Europe, in the SOP, um, SOP is generally, uh, the previous panel members have said you have to uh, give your impression to the um, the hiring members. So only write things that are uh, really uh, useful for this position. So if, if the topic is, uh, for example, this uh, topology, you can mention the things you have done in topology and which all courses you took in topology and why you are interested in topology and why this research question or something is interesting to you and how much you can contribute to this like uh, you have studied this book or have done this project or my master project was on this thing that kind of things uh, and why do you choose this institution so these are the main questions uh, you can answer in the SOP I guess and for the visa process at least for Europe I don't think it's a very if you're going for PhD it's not a financial burden uh, you have to give the visa fees and also the flight tickets. It will cost, uh, the flight tickets will be cost uh, around 50,000 Indian rupees, I guess. Uh, and the visa fees are also not that high. Um, but the only thing is that you might have to show some funding, but it's not necessary for PhD. So it also depends how your PhD is funded. If it's already funded, then actually there is no need to show any financial things. But if it is not, yes, you have to show uh, how you will survive in Austria. Uh, but in any case, I would suggest you to give some uh, financial background or something like my parents will take care of me or something like that, uh, kind of an affidavit. Then they can be make sure that, OK, if something goes wrong, you have somebody to take care of uh, you and you will not be a burden to the uh, new country. So, yeah, I think uh, I answered it. Somebody has some more opinion, please uh, answer. Uh, hello. Uh, so for SOP, I will tell you what I did. So first I wrote a draft, like uh, why I'm interested in math, what I did about my master's thesis, because I haven't completed my master's thesis that time, but a rough plan what I'm doing. 
like that then then after a few days when you read it you will realize okay nobody really care about these these things then remove that then again modify it then read it after two three days then you will again realize okay there is no need of mentioning these these things it can be written in some other way then again modify it like that do the modification for like 10 15 times and ask other people to read it like your friends seniors other phd students so slowly i think it's not a process that you can do in one day but it will take like two three months to get a very good refined sop that you will you itself will realize now if i'm reading my first draft of sop it's just i will feel more embarrassed because it's like many things we will think okay this is very great thing i have to add it but later we will realize okay really nobody cares this so i would say start writing then modify it uh, like two like 10 15 times yeah uh, i was going to ask if we have attended these uh, workshops and summer internships and things like that uh, should we include that also like we have been uh, interested in the research field and we have been trying to contact professors and things like that where should we add it or should we mention that thing in our application or is it useful yeah like i would like to answer this it will be useful for you and it will be useful in the way that you will get you will get to know one other professor other than your institute and you can have recommendation letter from him or her also and you should add this in your cv it will like helpful for you yes i want to i want to add to this like uh, uh, regarding adding summer schools and camps like you have to really see that which summer camps and workshops you have attended and that are useful for the particular project or phd students do not include each and everything because as other panel members also mentioned that your sop has to be very like precise and to the point related to the project and the area and also but you can still add the other workshops and things in your cv and they can have an opportunity to see from your cv but uh, in but in sop you, you have to be precise like which workshops re relates to this area or your work which are which you are planning to do yeah thank you thank you harita next is benny thomas are you there benny Uh, okay, let's move on to the next. It's uh, Arindam Mitra. Uh, hello, I am Arindam Mitra. I am a BSc third year student from Kolkata. I'm studying in Ramakrishna Mission with Yamandira. Actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, first of all, because I have a net issue, so I can't, I mean, on the camera. I'm sorry about that. Actually, my question is about the dad scholarship. Like, I am interested in it and I want to go to Germany for my PhD because obviously I'm late for the master's. I can't apply now. I am planning to do my master's at IIT Gandhi Nagar. So I just wanted to know, like, if, if someone wants to go to abroad for like, let's say PhD or postdoc, whatever the thing is, like, do we need, uh, internships? And also, I also have a question that do we need internship from abroad someplace and what if we need, like, what are the procedures to get into abroad internships? Yeah, anyone? Shubham, you can, if you want. Or anyone? Okay, okay. Uh, I think that... Uh, okay, sorry. I mean, maybe you can carry on. Yeah. So, uh, regarding internships and points, I think it's it's not a necessary part of your application uh, for sure. Of course, it is a plus if you have um, any any internships in India or abroad. But it's I would say it's it's not that important as your 
uh, enthusiasm and SOP and CV and all that stuff. And then the courses you are you have done, which is related to. So the so the whole point is like to uh, let the panel members know that you are fit to that particular topic or area. It's not about like how many internships and how fancy internships you have you have done through but of course it is an plus if you if you if you have one it, it is a plus but it is not necessary yeah and yeah i guess there were there are a lot many questions were together in that uh, one person so i guess uh yeah again uh, as shubham said number of internships doesn't count at all but uh, it just you just want to like prove yourself that you have done you have some sort of research experience because at least okay at least in europe you i mean after you are uh, shortlisted for an interview probably they might be asking you to present something so which would be like uh, so in my case i was presenting my master's thesis because, because that is it's on thesis which i have put most of my time uh, on in i mean in my research background so i was just uh, presenting my master's thesis and after that i mean they were just focusing on the thesis and after that they like slightly diverted and asked some other questions so uh, i guess you have to like maybe i mean if you are uh, going into that state when you have to like present something of course you should be having something in your pocket to just showcase right so in that sense it is important but of course the number doesn't matter at all and about the dad scholarship so uh, so as i said it is I mean, the scholarship is given in Germany. So if you're like focusing into some other country, I don't think, I mean, maybe each country have their own some uh, some sort of scholarship programs or some organizations. And so this is not just the only thing in Germany. So this is just one of the organizations and maybe majority of the students who's getting scholarship might be from that background. But also in my department, like in my department in the university, there are many students who's not a dad scholar. So in that case, they will be getting their amount. I mean, they will be getting some scholarship back from their own department. Or there, there are sort of some uh, research groups, as Shubham said, or some research project kind of thing. So they will be definitely getting a very good amount. So I, I just mentioned that because uh, it, to me, it feels like this is very good. I mean, as um, Rostam was saying, so if you want to like, I mean, if you, even if you are finding some difficulty with the finance issues, like say at least for taking some flight ticket from India to Europe or from back. So uh, they will give you all the flight uh, charges and also help you with the visa fees. And even if you want to, I mean, after say first year or second year of your PhD, if you want to like, come back to India for a month just for a vacation or something, they will again pay you for the flight ticket. So in all those terms, it's literally uh, quite helpful. I, I felt so that's why I mentioned. But yeah, so it's. I just want to say that. So that is a very good option, at least to Germany. But there are many other options as well. Oh, OK, so next is uh, Rika. Hello, my name is Rika. I'm from uh, Benares Hindu University. I completed my master's from there. And now I'm just uh, continuing my PhD. Actually, I already admitted there as a research scholar till one year, but, but uh, I'm not interested uh, in the topic uh, because their uh, algebra is not available there. So I'm interested in outside of India. Uh, my question is, uh, my in my master's, uh, there is no dissertation, no project. Uh, and in PhD degree, there re no research work till now completed. So it uh, what it is affected uh, when I apply in outside. Yeah, Minakshi or anyone? Yeah, uh, actually, again, like the same answer that you should convince them that you are fit for the position and in which you are applying. So it doesn't matter, actually. So however, you can convince. Oh, sometimes, like I want to add the uh, if you don't really working in that area, but you want to work. Sometimes at that uh, moment, they gave you project and they gave you time for like two, three weeks. This happened with me in one interview. 
they gave me one some particular topic and they told me to prepare that and give presentation after three weeks and i gave that okay. so this is also one thing i want to add uh excuse me uh, i have another question um uh, it's a last question actually i want to ask that if i want to apply in outside so uh if i am in uh, i'm interested in algebra if i am doing project in another topic like geometry topology uh it is acceptable i mean it is uh, granted for admission <laughs> yeah like again i am saying that uh, if the topic is completely different so somehow you have to convince them that you are really interested in the topic right so for that uh, whether they will ask you for prepare some presentation on some particular topic by giving their topics in which they are working or like you can convince them by your idea for their group like you have some new idea for their group like you can do this thing and you can convince them. mainly your focus is to just satisfying the uh, interview panel that you are really interested in that subject okay okay and uh, till now i'm just running i mean uh, continuing my phd uh, one year coursework is completed it is helpful anyway ah everything I mean, you are doing will be uh, helpful only but yeah so you can add like you are this is plus point only yeah? you are doing something and you tried something but you are not interested in that and you want to try new things so uh, it okay. would be kind of helpful you can say i mean i want to ask that it is uh, uh, improve uh, the quality of my cv or or no just ask this uh i think like uh, uh, some some of the universities in europe like they they don't accept any uh, applications if they are already into a phd course somewhere so like it's okay. it's it's not good to like mention this in your sop or cv or anywhere okay yeah oh so i actually i don't have any idea about university things so i'm sorry so for that okay i can uh, uh, see the all information from uh, uh, google or their website right yes yes exactly okay okay thank you huh yes hello yeah it's uh, uh, please, that, please yeah. repeat so uh, please please repeat shubham sir no i think uh, i said exactly at the end not anything else yeah sorry okay okay thank you thank you so much okay so next one is uh, marisha Hello, hello. Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah. Hello. So, uh, so my first question is specifically for Priya and Rakhil. So, since you're working in topology, so my question is that my master's thesis is um, applications of representation theory, group theory, in molecular symmetry. But I want to like study topology as a like the theoretical subject and further want to work in its applications in cosmic topology. So do you think that this will, you know, uh, switching from group theory and representation theory to topology, you know, will it be a disadvantage in my applications? That's my question. Uh, I don't think it would be a disadvantage. Uh, every U a university in the US is very, very much open to you changing your mind after you come here. So uh, th they don't expect you to have a fi fixed uh, line of work. So they don't expect you to just say topology and work in topology or say algebra and work in topology. They don't expect that. What they okay. do expect is that you are, uh, well, well uh, you have performed good in whatever you have done so uh, i i don't think it matters much you can so, very well like change. uh by the end of this month i will be just like able to send a publication obviously it takes time to get published and everything so uh it will be in some algebra journal so that won't be like uh, a drawback right it will be considered a good thing i hope it will be extremely positive it won't be a drawback yes okay uh, my second thing is so uh, 
right now till masters we have done a basic topology course which is provided in uh, i'm from nit right but so you know the up to like a basic point set topology and a bit of general topology so uh, but when i look at the profile so they have uh, very advanced fields so what do i do to bridge that gap like is it expected of me to know everything like uh, like from not theory or something from differential geometry or things like that so there's i feel like there's a certain gap in between so what do i do about it uh well in case of topology the first uh, in in our first year of phd you do uh, have this qualifying exams so the topology streams go like you study a course in geometry and topology the geometry is essentially differential geometry which will provide the basics for you and the second course in the basic course in topology will be algebraic topology so you are not expected to know further but uh, again uh, so you already have some yeah yeah, yeah. okay okay thank you uh, my next question is to minakshi like she is from max planck so if you could suggest anything that would you know make our um, application stand out like as she knows uh, i want to work for topology right so any suggestion that would be helpful um uh, marisha what kind of suggestion are you asking like i didn't get like uh, i do understand that we uh, have to make an a something a different sop like something different from the crowd and uh, as i said my thesis work is in representation theory but i'm applying for topology and mm -hmm. as you said before that our aim is to convince them that we are very interested in the subject but yeah. uh, so like what do i do for that like uh, right now i'm just reading different books and blogs on topology and the research that won't be enough right uh, should i, I will suggest take... i will hmm. suggest in which university or under which professor you are applying just see the area in which he or she is working and hmm. then in your if you are getting interview call from somewhere just try to in, convince them that you are highly interested in that research area in which they are working and you have new idea for that research area like you can um, you can propose some ideas like new ideas that you can work in that field which can be um, which okay. can be like really helpful for you okay thank you uh, can I add one point? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, it's not a negative that you're having uh, some area for your master's and a different area for PhD. Sometimes they also view it like you have a wide spectrum of uh, research interest. For example, if you have, you said that you have the um, algebra for your uh, yeah. masters yeah. then for applying topology these fields are not really distinct i mean there are uh, algebraic applications in topology and so on yeah, so yeah. so these connections are there so they can also feel like okay you are actually better than someone who only knows topology so you you are interested in topology and you also have um, algebraic background so i don't think that it's a negative you can kind of project it su uh, in a, such a way that it's actually a benefit to your group um, because i also have this background so uh, you have to write it in that way okay okay yeah no, so i, I can make it a plus point yeah yes yes hello yeah please continue yeah, so I just add one thing. Okay, uh, since yeah. you said you're interested in topology, I'm not working in topology, but um, Copenhagen ha is, I would say, it's a, one of the best schools for topology. So you can yeah. just go to the department website and see what people are doing. But I think here most people are doing surgery theory, homotopy theory, then some condensed math, those things okay. like the. Uh, so, and I think it. Uh, I don't really know here, like at least the topology people who are admitted here for PhD already have a good knowledge in homotopy theory. I think so, because here for at least yeah. in the PhD is three years. So we don't really have the time to start from the basics. So yeah. here, uh, here they will take the master's thesis little bit seriously. Uh, 
because okay. it's three years, right? So uh, yeah. we don't really have the time to start from the beginning. But I would say since you're really interested in topology, I would suggest you to check the website of professors and see what they are doing. This is a very good place for topology. And I would say like, yeah, they are also, there are also uh, new professor postdocs coming. So it's a very big group here, topology. That compared to geometry, uh, the topology group is very big here. Okay, so sorry to we... interrupt, but yeah, yeah, uh, we have to yeah. go fast because others okay. are also waiting. So okay. try to okay. ask the most important questions that you want to. Yeah. Okay, know. no, I'm, I'm done for today. I'm done. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the next is Simar Preet. Call. Good evening, everyone present here. So my story is similar to many of the people present here. I completed my master's from Central University of Punjab in 2022. And afterwards, I'm working as an assistant professor in a state university. Uh, so that my question is, I did my master's project in relativity and cosmology, but I couldn't get it published. After that, I start studying some new things like uh, AI and mathematical applications. So, so now my interest is a little bit different. Uh, actually, information geometry and sensual geometry both are just generalization of a Riemannian geometry. So both are closely related. So my question is to uh, Manisha Minakshi, ma'am. Uh, my question is this: uh, How can I like stand out of the flood of those uh, uh, those applications? Uh, I have designed a research proposal as well in information geometry. Uh, it's been two years I'm studying this. So how can I get out of it? Because my uh, master's work doesn't align with the the, work, the thing I am I want to do now. So can you give me some suggestions? Yeah, again, like the same thing in which you are like uh, did you apply for some university or something with this new subject or you are just planning to apply uh, i didn't get it um, uh, yeah um max Planck is my dream institute undoubtedly but uh i am not confined to some specific topic i am i am open uh, i can i can put my efforts and uh, i'm ready to put my efforts and study something new if, if they offer me so, it's yeah, just again just in which like new subject you are just want to apply just come up with the idea in which you can convince them that you are just perfect for their group like you can de do the things in better way in which the group is working so yeah uh, you, uh, you have to anyway convince them that uh, uh, you can work new for them or you can work for the betterment of their group in any way. Okay, okay ma'am, the one thing you mentioned is presentation. So uh, recently I uh, I delivered a lecture on information geometry, the thing I am planning to do uh, in a recent college. So uh, should I need to prepare for a presentation uh, prior uh, from the even before they get even before they call me for interview or something like uh not really i didn't prepare like this like before interview but because i applied in germany so just be stick with time definitely uh, oh, and uh, like not with the presentation they'll uh, like my interview is for half an hour like i am talking about this max planck one only this was of half an hour and in which 10 minutes, like I have to present, give my presentation in 15 minutes and 15 minutes, they'll ask question. They, so uh, you should be like, if they are saying you, your presentation is in 15 minutes, then it should be in 15 minutes only. Okay, ma'am. Now one thing, uh, one more thing. Uh, so sometimes in, in some universities, uh, we need to uh, email the uh, email the respective professor we we want to do our project under. Uh, no? So so my question is, is is it okay to attach our SOP research proposal and uh, CV all these things with the email only? Yeah, I got this position also by this way only that I mail email like my professor um, like the I I saw. 
his work area and i was very interested and i was working in the same and i mailed him uh, by attaching my cv and sop with it and then they asked me with like other documents and then they called me for interview yeah you should do that and you can do thank you thank you so much i think i am done okay next is sudeshna are you there okay so neeraj yes hello am yeah. i audible yeah yeah uh hello uh, i am neeraj i have completed my integrated msc from nit surat in 2023 and uh, so i uh, i am interested in combinatorics and uh, its applications in uh, like it is a, uh, as it is a very vast area i am flexible to uh, uh, doing phd in uh, regarding in any project regarding combinate uh, with uh, combinatorics and its application i have done two uh, i have done one srfp and one uh, master's thesis with it but uh, as svnit didn't uh, Uh, have any co uh, coursework with combinatorics hello everyone myself shubhishan shami currently i am uh, pursuing masters uh, yeah uh, i am uh, audible shubhishna uh, just wait and yeah, neeraj yeah neeraj has started so let him finish hello yeah neeraj continue yeah sorry uh, so uh i have done a srfp uh, uh, summer intern and one master thesis but uh, i have not done any coursework uh, uh, with um, which like for combinatorics and i want to do phd in europe and i have observed that some graduate schools offer integrated phd with uh, msc course with in it so will it be better for me to apply for uh integrated phd instead of direct phd because uh, the main concern my main concern is that as combinatorics is very is very vast subject my both one one summer intern and my thesis were uh, totally different like they were not related and so each time i had to do that i had to learn the fundamental uh, fundamentals uh, for that particular project so will will uh, will there be a time Uh, if i go to a uh, phd project to learn such fundamentals regarding that project and then do the research work or would it be uh, better for me to do integrated uh, phd so that i can uh, like get the foundations uh, get the foundations better hello Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have one question. So in which area you have done your masters? Okay, I have done. Uh, my masters was in discrete mass theory. Uh, discrete mass theory. Like, okay. Yes. And uh, you have done your um, summer project this SRP things in combinatorics. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, okay. It was uh, uh, in the inter. Uh, in, it was in the like. uh algebra and combinatorics it, it concerned with voronoi reduction theory it was just a phd thesis uh, phd thesis of doc, doc, uh regarding sphere coverings and all and i mm -hmm. uh, uh, studied the one studied one section of it okay and uh, in combinatorics uh, do you have any preference of which uh, area or which part of combinatorics you are interested in in, in no, no, have... no no like okay. i am flexible in that way Mm -hmm. uh in that case you can uh, also apply for phd i think you don't need a masters for it I if you don't have the um, uh, combinatorics course before uh, you can take it as a course work for phd in my case um, i have i have a background in graph theory but my phd was in graph drawings which are actually quite different from the tricks and techniques that we use in graph theory uh so i i really took the discrete and computational geometry as a coursework and start from uh, from the scratch so for me e even though i have known um, i know some of the graph theory things uh, none of the techniques can be applied here so i have to kind of study everything anew so it will take you some time to learn the basics 
uh, but it also depends on you. Uh, if you you have to put more effort than your colleagues for sure, yeah. but I don't think that you really have to go for a, a masters because your um, research will be very specific. For example, in the combinatorics there are many things. So uh, if yes. if you are doing something very specific, you might need only those things which are relevant to that area. So you don't have to study the whole combinatorics things for just to solve this question. Uh, so I think. If you get admitted, your guide will suggest you what are uh, courses you have to take. And uh, if you already know which topic or if you are already getting an interview call, you might know what is the area. Then read some papers or try to read some papers in that area. And if you are able to grasp things, I think that is fine. Uh, if you are not getting some words clearly, then check back and see what, what are those words. So you don't have to really learn the whole textbook for it um it i mean it is good but it is not necessary yeah and one, one, okay. sorry, one, one additional sorry just a small uh question uh, so uh, for, uh, one more thing about the integrated phd um, does it sorry, increases sorry the chance of ac your acceptance um Yes, so yes actually i have one other meeting at six so i have to leave sorry yeah okay no problem thank you minakshi thanks a lot thank you so much thank you so much excuse me hello hello okay, uh Neeraj was continuing so let him Neeraj pass <laughs> yeah so uh, my question was just just was that yeah Dear, uh, you can uh, take a, you can share your queries in our group. We will direct them to the resource persons uh, because the time is very limited. Shikha, we can we can move to yes, other sir. things. Yes, sir. Uh, so participants, you can uh, give your queries in our WhatsApp group. So at the end of the session, you will get to know to how to join it. So let's move on to the vote of thanks. I would like to call Miss Elsa Mary Jose, St. Peter College, College, Colincherry, Kerala. Thank you, Sika. Gratitude is a powerful catalyst for happiness. It's a spark that ignites the fire of joy in your soul. Good evening, everyone. I, Elsa Mary Jose, feel honored and privileged to have the opportunity to express my gratitude in this interactive section with research scholars from international institutions. Initially, I extend heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ambad Vijay Kumar Sir, Emeritus Professor, Department of Mathematics, Cochin University of Science and Technology, for blessing us with his kind words and presence. I would like to thank Pan. I would like to thank the panel members, Dr. Roshna Pol, Ms. Ashwadi Baiju, Ms. Priya Kaveri Vivi, Ms. Meenakshi Verma, Ms. Visna Mary Eldo, Ms. Samanvaya R. Beti, Mr. Rakil Baburam, Mr. Shubham Jiswal for sharing the experiences and advice on preparing for higher studies abroad. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Vinod Kumar, sir, Associate Professor, Department of Mathematics, Government College, Thirur, Kerala, for being the backbone of this program and for his constant guidance and support. I extend heartfelt thanks to Dr. Bijumon, sir, Associate Professor, Department of Mathematics, MG College, Iriti, Kannur, Kerala, for the support and technical assistance of our group. I am also grateful to the moderators of this section, Ms. Ajina NP and Ms. Higa Kumari, who handled and managed the section smoothly. Once again, thank you all for making this meeting successful. Thank you.